Oh, really? Is it duplicate or one? People are still eating, so uh, we'll be a few more minutes. Um, just thank you for your patience and go out and get some more food.
Good evening. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, it was uh, very challenging to break away from the food. Uh, we're very uh, fortunate here at MSU that we have uh, an interest in indigenous foods, and, and tonight's menu uh, for the reception was, was courtesy of, of um, our staff, not our staff, but MSU's catering uh, from their indigenous foods um, menu. Uh, my name's Walter Fleming. I'm the department head of Native American Studies. Uh, I'm also known as Wasasuk uh, in the uh, Kickapoo language, of which I'm a member. That means light lying down. And I'm also um, a member of the White Bear Clan. So if there's any White Bear Clan members, there never are, but I'm, I'm related to you. Um, and it's my pleasure to, uh, to uh, introduce our speaker, but also to tell you a little bit about uh, the occasion, uh, the Phyllis Berger Memorial, Memorial um, Lecture. <coughs> Tonight uh, is, is uh, one event of a continuing number of events that we've be begun this morning. Um, this is a part of the inclusive teaching, mentoring, and research uh, uh, program that, that uh, many of you were at. I, I, I recognize many of you from that. And we're very uh, great, grateful that you were able to come tonight uh, for the lecture. <coughs> and we're particularly uh, pleased that that went so well, and it was because of the efforts of Ariel Donahue. Where are you, Ariel? There she is. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Kristen Ruppel from Native American Studies, who worked very hard as well. And for the, for the many unsung uh, heroes to make uh, the events that we've been sharing uh, work so well. I want to begin with a, with a land acknowledgement as I did this afternoon and recognize that we are on tribal territory. And so it reads this way, we acknowledge and honor with respect the indigenous nations on whose traditional homelands the university now stands and whose historical relationships with the land continues to this day. We ask our spiritual ancestors to forgive our intrusion and humbly ask for their guidance. Tonight, you're going to hear about two uh, aspects of the of the uh, lecture before we actually get to it. One is that uh, this is the Phyllis Berger Memorial Lecture, and and so I, I want to acknowledge that. And it's being given by the Katz Family Chair in Native American Studies, so I want to acknowledge that. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background about about that. Um, Phyllis Berger Memorial Lecture is made possible by a bequest from the late Phyllis Berger, uh, who graduated from Montana State University in 1941 in zoology. Uh, she was a longtime supporter of Native American studies, and it was her desire that the department continue its national leadership in the field of Native American studies. As a fitting memorial to Phyllis in 1987, the department established a lecture series in her honor to bring to MSU in the Gallatin Valley uh, nationally recognized Native American scholars and artists, as well as indigenous artists uh, and, and scholars. In 2000, the, Nat uh, the Department of Native American Studies established its endowed chair in Native American Studies. Uh, the scholarship and service offered by the holder of the CATS chair uh, will enhance the department's, or is intended to enhance the department's efforts in producing first-class scholarship on behalf of Native people and the university. Uh, the person who established that, um, uh, the, the um, endowed chair I just saw, I think he, uh, Dr. Wayne Stein, and, and I was hoping he would be on cue and walk in, but, oh, there he is. Uh, we're very grateful for Dr. Wayne Stein, way up there, uh, who had the forethought to, uh, to create uh, both the, the endowed chair uh, and uh, was a part of the, the uh, Phyllis Berger Memorial Lecture. Uh, the chair is one of four in the nation housed in Native American Studies programs and uh, is named after Sheldon and Audrey Katz, 
of Maryland, ardent supporters of the Department of Native American Studies. Uh, Sheldon Katz was a pioneer in software development in the late 1970s, um, and the Katz established a computer company, uh, Data Prompt Inc., uh, providing ser service to such clients as the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And so we're very grateful uh, for their uh, generosity in establishing the endowed chair, which is being brought together in the form of Lauren Birdrattler, who uh, is our current endowed chair. We're very proud that he thought so much of um, of our relationship that he would he would uh, come to MSU and and serve in that capacity. Uh, Lauren has worked with uh, is is working with the university to create an indigenous research inst uh, initiative that will align uh, native-based research in the academy with tribal pr priorities. Uh, Montana State University's Native American Studies uh, is one of um, only four public universities, uh, which then does have a chair. Uh, he currently serves also as a project manager for the development of Blackfeet Nation's Agricultural Resource Management Plan. Uh, a plan that creates policy in agriculture, uh, land conservation, water resource management, holistic management practices, as well as agriculture and livestock regulation for both the Blackfeet tribe and the United States government. Uh, he has a long list of accomplishments, and uh, you can refer to, to uh, the published uh, long, very long list of accomplishments uh, among which more recently is he uh, uh, presented at the uh, National Forum for Large Landscape Conservation and Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at the United Nations, both on indigenous approaches to natural and agricultural resource management, conservation, climate adaptation, as well as preserving um, uh, at the inaugural International Symposium on uh, North American Conservation Impact, sponsored by the the Salazar Center for North American Conservation at, the uh, at Colorado State University. Uh, Lauren grew up on a family ranch just uh, 40 miles south of Browning, uh, the traditional homelands of the Blackfeet Nation. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Lauren Birdrattler. Well, gosh, thank you, Walter. I certainly appreciate that gracious introduction. And thank you all for taking time out of your schedules or your schedules to uh, uh, join us this evening. You know, I'm, I'm always uh, very honored when I see folks in the crowd, you know, that, um, that take time out of, their, uh, out of their schedules, right? You know, to, uh, to come and listen to some of the things and some of the work that we've done in Blackfeet country uh, in correlation with uh, Montana State University and the Native Land Project. So um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy that you're here as well. Um, uh, I first uh, just wanted to uh, start by thanking um, uh, uh, President Cruzado, um, uh, who uh, pushed through the native provision uh, that, uh, that you see in the title, right, increasing mutually beneficial collaborations with tribal nations. So as we think about what that means and we think about the history of the work that has already been done, I certainly want to acknowledge all of those folks that have worked very hard in the past to get us to where we're at today. Um, uh, fortunately for me, I get to take that, um, uh, <coughs> that torch and run with it. And so as we think about a lot of that past work, um, there are many folks that have worked very hard, uh, including uh, past um, uh, endowed chairs, Katz family chairs, um, uh, Bill Yellowtail to name one. Uh, I think that we heard uh, about uh, some of his contributions earlier today, um, uh, as well as many others that have uh, uh, done some work here at the university to move us into this space. So again, I'm very um, uh, pleased to not only be here this evening, but also to follow in, in the great footsteps of all of that work that's being done, including that work that was done by uh, Dr. Wayne Stein. And so, um, as we start out, I just wanted to preface a couple of things. The first is that uh, all of these pictures are taken from the Blackfeet Nation, and so this um, uh, uh, presentation may uh, come across as very Blackfeet-centric, since I am Blackfeet, um, and, and have been working for the tribal government there for a few years. Uh, but at the very end of the day, um, I, want what, uh, I want you all to be thinking about the opportunities that we can be uh, building through partnerships with tribes, uh, not only in the state of Montana, but across the region. 
as we think about the opportunities to increase the $25 million that we currently uh, receive in, in native-based research, it gives us a great foundation through uh, equitable partnerships with tribes, through uh, reasonable partnerships with tribes, to grow that number from uh, 25 million to 50 million to 100 million uh, to 150 million, to, to really include tribes in that process, to help build uh, capacity um, in tribal communities, and so it offers great opportunity as we think about uh, positioning Montana State to really lead the country in Indigenous research. And so as we think about the creation of the Indigenous Research Initiative, um, uh, we think about all of those things as we move forward. Uh, so in terms of, of uh, the presentation tonight, I'm going to be talking about who we are, you know, uh, not just as uh, Indigenous people or Amskapi Bagani, Southern Blackfeet, uh, but also uh, where we come from. Um, our partnership with Montana State University and a lot of the great work that we've been able to do through that partnership uh, uh, that started with the um, um, uh, um, Indigenous Research Initiative as well as the Native Land Project uh, here at Native Studies at uh, MSU. Um, I'm going to talk about our work, I'm going to talk about the opportunity, and then I'm going to talk about the Indigenous Research Initiative here at Montana State. And so those little beings on the right side of that, uh, uh, of that photo, are uh, that's an aerial view of the E&E, &E or, or, or the bison, or buffalo. Uh, when I'm speaking to mostly non-native folks, I usually say bison. When I'm speaking to native folks, I say buffalo. When I'm speaking to Blackfeet, I say E&E. &E. And so uh, whichever you feel comfortable with, um, uh, please. Um. So first, you know, in terms of who we are, and we think about the Blackfoot Confederacy, the original uh, Blackfeet territory, um, uh, our current, uh, let me start over, our current uh, area is in the northwest corner of the state. We border Glacier National Park on the west, Alberta, Canada on the uh, north. Um, but our original territory, our, the very first Blackfeet nation, uh, uh, went from mountaintop to mountaintop. It, it started on the, along the Continental Divide, came all the way down, encompassed where we're at currently, um, <coughs> uh, took in half of Yellowstone National Park and followed the Yellowstone River to the Dakotas. Um, back up to the Canadian border and then, of course, back west to the Continental Divide. So when we think about that expansive space, you know, uh, it later became the common hunting ground for all tribes, but it was originally the Blackfeet Nation. So as we uh, think about uh, uh, Montana State and its current geographical location, we have many folks to thank for um, uh, uh, being very good stewards prior to um, the current growth here at, in Bozeman or in the Gallatin Valley. So in terms of uh, the Blackfeet Nation, um, uh, uh, for those of you that like the metric system, we're about 640,000 hectares large, uh, about a million and a half acres. Um, we um, are about um, uh, twice the size of Rhode Island, you know, maybe about the same size as the island nation of Puerto Rico. And so when we think about that, um, it, it gives you a little bit of context to think about a space that uh, we can certainly help influence in terms of uh, uh, how uh, Montana State influences um, uh, uh, and creates a pipeline for Native students coming from uh, the Blackfeet Nation and other nations, and, and how we uh, work with those nations to, to um, uh, think through uh, and allow them to lead many of the initiatives that are going on there on the ground. And so we um, are a sovereign nation, uh, 17,321 members um, uh, strong. We're a member of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Uh, I mentioned Amskapi Bagani. We're the only tribe in the United States that's a part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. We have three tribes on the northern side of, uh, uh, of the Canadian border, uh, the um, uh, Gaina, or the Blood Tribe, the Sigzaga, and the Northern Blackfeet. So that becomes um, uh, very important as we think about commercial agriculture, production agriculture, the ability to, to internationally market your production. Um, uh, the the uh, tribes on the northern side of the border become very important as we think about the creation of an international trade umbrella that allows us the flexibility to trade either out of the United States or out of Canada. And so I'll uh, touch a little bit more on that as we move into the presentation. But as I uh, talk about the, this partnership that, uh, the, uh, between the Blackfeet Tribe and Montana State University, uh, again, I want you all to be thinking about the opportunities that exist as we think about uh, all tribal nations in this region. You know, the opportunities in research, in practical application, in uh, creating that, um, that uh, um, pipeline. I don't think I'm supposed to mention that. Creating that conduit, right, of, uh, of uh, Native students uh, coming to Montana State University and researching uh, topics that are very dear to their heart, right? You know, and so, um, uh, so, so please think about that as, you, um, as, as we peruse these slides. 
So, so the first is we think about partners, uh, uh, partnerships with tribes. Um, it offers us great opportunity. You know, the, the biggest opportunity is that tribes are quasi-sovereign, right? You know, I always like to put that quasi, you know, because uh, tribes do slide under the United States uh, um, Congress from a jurisdictional complexity. And so you'll often hear, you know, uh, oh, oh, we're 100% sovereign. We're a, a nation within a nation, and that just isn't correct. We're quasi-sovereign. Uh, the uh, United States Congress, as they have done in the past, have the power to terminate tribes. So it's very important that we um, uh, mention that or that we're cognizant about that as we think about uh, the ability that tribes can um, uh, accomplish as they think about moving into spaces around policy development, their own legal framework, regulatory framework, all of that. And so um, uh, as we think about um, uh, quasi-sovereign nations and our ability to partner with them, um, uh, it gives us great opportunity to, to um, uh, invest in, in the 15,000 years of methodology um, uh, around traditional ecological knowledge that has been passed down generation to generation. So as we think about that, we've been stewards of our territory since time immemorial. And so as we think about the scientific process, the scientific process oftentimes limits how we recognize indigenous knowledge uh, because of the process uh, uh, in, the, in, in the scientific process. You know, and so as we think about that, um, uh, usually the scientific process says, okay, well, we're gonna reach, research something, we're gonna um, take these findings, and we're gonna take the, uh, create a, a methodology for implementation. Uh, it, it tends to be the exact opposite for tribes. We have 15,000 years worth of methodology. We merely want to utilize Western science to substantiate that methodology and not the other way around. So as we think about the recognition of other bodies of knowledge, it's very important to think about that as we think about uh, uh, the role that Montana State University plays, not only in uh, its relationship with its native students and other students, but also how it forms partnerships with tribes themselves. Uh, when we think about uh, um, uh, sovereignty or quasi-sovereignty, uh, tribes uh, have the ability to create their own laws, to create their own regulatory framework, uh, to create uh, uh, many things uh, that, that are afforded the same things that state governments are afforded. So when we think about a jurisdictional complexity, you have the, uh, the federal government or the United States government, you have tribes and state governments uh, in terms of a hierarchy that are uh, uh, on the same level. So as you look at the ability, um, uh, say, through policy, um, the Code of Federal Regulations, right, governs uh, implementation of laws at the, at the federal level. At the state level, you have the um, Montana Code annotated, right? At, tribal, at the tribal level, excuse me, you have very few codes that are in place. So as we think about um, uh, everything that I'm going to talk about and we think about ecosystems planning or systems planning, it allows us the opportunity to create the legal framework that allows us to do pilots in, in, in spaces that you can't do in already established governments. So it offers great opportunity for us here at Montana State to help think through how we uh, um, uh, uh, support tribes in developing that policy or that legal framework that allows them to, to uh, adequately manage their natural resources, their agricultural resources, to redefine the health delivery system. Uh, when we think about a Western approach, Western systems tend to, uh, because it's profitable, uh, treat symptoms, right, and, and never the core challenge. So we know for example, through, say, language reintroduction, native language reintroduction. Embedded in the language is the practice of who we are as native people. Right, so when we teach the language, uh, we also teach the value system. So once you teach that language and you give a native their identity back, um, uh, what you see is an automatic decline in the byproducts of acculturation and assimilation. So when we think about alcohol misuse, uh, drug misuse, um, uh, domestic violence, all of those things, they tend to decline on their own just by teaching the language. So when you give that identity back to a native, um, uh, what happens is they understand that value system and they know and understand that these uh, symptoms are not a part of our value system and they're not a part of the practice of who we are as Native people. So rather than sending them to treatment, sending them to the clinic, sending them to all of these uh, Western systems, all you have to do is teach a language and all of these byproducts decline on their own. So I mentioned that because I want you to think about how uh, uh, Indigenous approaches and Indigenous methodology, uh, methodology can help add to uh, uh, new knowledge, right, as we think about what, uh, our responsibility here at Montana State to educate and to implement. 
right? You know, and so uh, that's just one example. So as we think about sovereign nations, we have the opportunity to invest in those nations and, again, uh, uh, um, offer resources that allow tribes to uh, put together that legal framework that allows us to change the delivery system of, of uh, many of those Western approaches that tend to not be working in Indian country and in many other spaces. So when we think about commercial food production, that is um, the regulatory uh, framework uh, behind commercial food production, it's influenced by corporate farming, right? You know, so when you think about, say, GMOs, uh, uh, you get a genetically modified crop, you see a variation of that crop in the next field, right? You know, the, the owner of that, um, uh, uh, that patent or that trademark then can seize the entire crop, right? You know, a, a lot of our framework is written by uh, the, the people that influence Congress most. So when you think about the ability to reclaim that space, we can invest in tribes and allow ourselves to really uh, create pilot programs that are then translational not only to other native communities, but to non-native spaces as well. So it gives us great opportunity as we think about the Indigenous Research Initiative here at Montana State and what that uh, uh, can do um, down the road. So I'm going to make a case for uh, working with um, uh, tribes, you know, and in this case, it's in the conservation space, right? You know, so when we think about conservation, um, uh, in Blackfeet country, we have 80% uh, of the large vertebrates in Montana, just in our little million and a half acres. So when you think about the state of Montana being um, a little less than 94 million acres, or you think about a large state map, right? You know, uh, I think uh, Walter had made some jokes earlier about a phone booth and some other things, right? Well, I'm going to take you back to when we used to use maps, right? <laughs> you think about a large state map, right? And you take two fingers, right? You know, you'll cover the Blackfeet nation on that large state map, right? We possess 80% of the large vertebrates in Montana. We possess uh, eight cultural keystone species, uh, bison, grizzly bear, wolverine, deer, elk, the black-footed uh, black ferrets, the swift fox, the beaver, right? You know, as we think about beaver relocation and uh, natural um, uh, method or indigenous methodologies for water resource management, it gives us great opportunity to really invest in those spaces. Uh, and we um, also um, uh, possess 30% of the select glo global bird species. So when we think about indigenous areas, we know that indigenous areas across the globe make up uh, about 25% of the land mass. We also know that indigenous spaces make up about 80% of the biodiversity. So when we think about conservation at large and uh, the influence that conservation, the conservation movement has, uh, it has uh, been uh, uh, primarily reactive, right, instead of being proactive, right? And when I say reactive, we wait until we deplete a resource, then we try and restore it, we try and restore its habitat, we move very swiftly to um, uh, uh, buy up land to preserve habitat, right? You know, when we have all of these indigenous spaces that we can invest in and actually be proactive, instead of reactive, right? You know, so as you think about uh, the ability to really uh, utilize partnerships with tribal nations, right, uh, it allows us again to move into new spaces. So I'm gonna very quickly cover our partnership, uh, the partnership between Montana State University and the Blackfeet Nation. Um, it was established in 2016. It started with, um, uh, and, and I mention this because as you all form those partnerships and go out to tribal communities, you know, you have to be co cognizant of the lay of the land. And so uh, you're dealing with um, uh, mostly underserved communities, right, that, that uh, don't have a tremendous amount of capacity. They have a very small prom committee, right, that select few people that do everything, that wear about 30 different hats, right, you know, and so when, so, uh, when you go into tribal communities, it's very important to remember that, right, you know, um, uh, most of the people on our MSU Blackfeet team uh, came, uh, came to our department, the Agricultural Resource Management uh, uh, Program, uh, through someone else, right? They called up, said, hey, we're trying to do this. You know, a, a lot of uh, department directors, even council members, didn't have a lot of time to nurture that re uh, relationship. So they sent them to the ARMP. They sent them to our program, right? You know, so so the first thing I asked any one of them is, well, wh wh why are you here, first of all, right? And then secondly, uh, what is it that you're trying to accomplish, right? And from that uh, conversation, we were able to put together a team that uh, began to, um, uh, 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 do a lot of work uh, in Blackfeet country in terms of that partnership that really ha helped us think through 
not only methodology, but uh, practical application through the planning process. So our relationship started when, you know, this um, uh, young lady walked into my office and said, uh, Councilman Tatsy sent me down here to talk to you, <laughs> right? And that was Dr. Kristen Ruppel. And I said, okay, and she had, a, you know, a few people with her, right? You know, and so, uh, but from that time, we've been able to um, uh, invite MSU up uh, and the Native Land Project monthly uh, with graduate students, PhD students, right, to be a part of our planning process. So we hold a, a monthly public meeting that is uh, uh, very transparent. As you think about building trust in institutions, higher education, government, um, uh, the population at large tends to really um, uh, be distrustful. So as we think about building that trust, it's absolutely um, uh, necessary that we have transparency. So we uh, invited them up for our monthly meetings and they began to participate, helped us record, did some live polling, um, uh, influenced some of the conversations, uh, listened, 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 and listened, <laughs> right, to learn, right? You know, they didn't come in, uh, you know, like many uh, organizations do, helicopter in and say, this is how we do things and this is how we want you to do things. They came in and said, we're willing to listen, we're willing to learn, where can we be of most service, where could we be of, uh, of most help? Right, you know, so uh, I mentioned that because it's a perfect example of how partnerships should be as we think about tribal nations, right, as we think about insular communities, as we think about uh, opportunities uh, within those spaces. So uh, we uh, worked on local agenda setting, uh, data sharing and IP agreements, uh, tribal IRB and council approval. You know, um, I, I asked um, one of the PhD candidates here, Jill Mackin, if she would assist our, our land managers um, on uh, re, um, reauthorizing and thinking through the, the process to update the grazing resolution, a resolution that takes place every 10 years that really governs the um, uh, distribution of leases, uh, agricultural leases, range leases, all of that. Um, and, and so uh, as, we, as I think about the history of our partnership, it has been, uh, it has been a, a partnership that's been dear to my heart because for the first time in my professional career, I dealt with folks that didn't want to come in and, and, uh, and helicopter in, right? Didn't want to come in and say, you need to do things like this, right? Actually came in and said, we want to learn from you. So um, uh, it, it, it led to, of course, my uh, position here at Montana State. So as we think about our work, um, I was asked a question after presenting at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at the UN, um, how I utilize the UN framework to um, uh, inform everything that we're doing in the Blackfeet Nation. And I said, if I utilize that UN framework, every one of those ranchers in Blackfeet country, every one of those council members, every one of those uh, uh, programmatic directors would tell me, you go work someplace else, you go work for the UN, right? You know, because here in Blackfeet country, we have to do things from a Blackfeet perspective. So that means Blackfeet ways of knowing, Blackfeet ways of being, Blackfeet ways of planning. Now, happenstance, uh, because those uh, sustainable goals at the United Nations um, uh, were, developed, uh, was, um, were developed by indigenous peoples, um, uh, they're completely aligned with everything that we came up with within the Blackfeet Nation. But I mention that because we don't ever want to, again, come in, helicopter in, and say, this is how you need to do things, right? And I'm going to say this over and over throughout, uh, throughout the presentation because uh, I, I, want you to, I want it to stick. I want you to leave here knowing that, there, that we're looking at different methodologies and how we form partnerships with indigenous nations. So as we think about that, all of our work is uh, informed by our core values. Right, our core Amskapi Bagani values, or our core Bagani values, right? You know, so the first of those values is um, uh, Blackfeet ways of knowing, Blackfeet culture, spirituality, and philosophy, thought, and action, right? So that means that uh, as we think about our core values, we're practicing, uh, we're practicing them uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, right? Not just at 11 o'clock on Sunday or seven o'clock on Wednesday evening, but 24 seven all the time, right? We utilize these core values to inform policy development, to inform programmatic implementation, to inform everything that we're doing. And if we follow these core values, then uh, uh, we are addressing core um, takes care of itself. So if you practice these uh, core values in everything that you do, um, uh, then everything takes care of itself. 
right? You know, so the second is uh, respect and care of the natural world, oneself, all other people, all uh, all relations, right? And when we think about all relations, that's all living beings, right? So that means that uh, uh, we have respect for the water, for the land, when we think about soil quality, right? When we think about water quality, right? When we think about biodiversity, biohabitat, and how we, uh, in our case, create a higher profitability through uh, protection of biohabitat, right? Through the methodologies of raising commercial food, uh, uh, commercial food, right? You know, so at the end of the day, what we want to look at is how we utilize these core values, the respect for all of those living beings to create higher profitability uh, through, um, uh, through different methodologies, right? Trying hard, commitment, dedication, sincerity, and the pursuit of all of our goals. Leadership, professionalism, integrity, and respectability in human interaction. Living in a good way, honest in all thoughts and actions. Accepting everyone, embracing the unique talents and contributions of each individual. And then this, that last one is very necessary as we think about, uh, I'm going to move this over, pardon me. Um, that last one becomes very critical as we think about that small prom committee again, right? You know, if we're ever going to build capacity and prevent burnout, you know, at the, at the tribal level, we have to uh, um, uh, take into consideration happy living humor, laughter, and enjoyment of life. As you look at historical trauma, all of that, and, and you think about uh, the space that uh, tribes are in today, native people are in today, if we're not practicing that last core value, right, then you're going to continue to see the burnout that exists in tribal communities. So I'm trying not to go too fast, you know, um, so I hope you all have a little bit of time. You know, usually I have to present all of this information in 20 or 30 minutes, you know, and so I'm going to attempt to do that. But at the end of the day or at the end of the evening, you're probably going to be sitting here at 930 at night. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And so as we think about a holistic approach in, in uh, planning methodology, uh, this is the... Um, uh, um, uh, methodology that we developed in conjunction with the Native Land Project here at Montana State University. And so the first is uh, um, uh, we ground our planning in Begunny values and stewardship of the land. <coughs> we make our plans in-house. If we're ever going to build capacity in tribal communities and put uh, graduates from Montana State University to work, right, we need to ensure that we're uh, making those plans in-house, not outsourcing them to uh, engineering firms, not outsourcing them to other um, uh, professional organizations. Um, we need to build that capacity through the uh, development of plans in Indian communities. Uh, we collaborate with our people, and I do mean all of our people. Right, you know, um, as we think about uh, having everybody at the table, we want to ensure that we have recreationalists, that we have medicinal plant gatherers, that we have traditional food preparers alongside commercial beef producers, uh, commercial bison producers, commercial grain growers, commercial pulse crop growers, right? We use high quality data. Right? Tribes have a real challenge in accessing and utilizing data. If we're not thinking about how we create data for tribes, then we're just not thinking. I haven't used that one in a long time. Then we're just not thinking. Right? Uh, when you look at the ability to access USDA data, uh, HHS data, Health and Human Service data, um, U.S. Department of Interior data, it's problematic at best, even through a FOIA request. So any of you that have done research on native topics know exactly what I'm talking about. It becomes very problematic just to access the smallest um, uh, uh, sets of data. So we need to be thinking about how we create data for tribes, right, or how we help them create their own data. Um, we uh, recognize both traditional and, um, and modern li uh, land use and livelihoods, right? I think that I had mentioned that uh, medicinal plant gatherers alongside commercial food producers. We engage in necessary partnerships to plan, like the, the partnership with the Native Land Project here at MSU, uh, the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas, Yale University, Cornell University, uh, many of our other partners um, at the Blackfeet Nation. Uh, we make sure that our plans are implementable, right? You know, as you look at uh, government-created plans, uh, higher education-created uh, plans, uh, many of them uh, sit on the shelf. They gain dust. Um, uh, we utilize them uh, as an inventory. We utilize them to substantiate another grant. But we don't tend to implement them. Right, you know, so as we think about implementing plans or strategic plans, we want to ensure that we're making uh, correlations to first a timeline. When is that work going to be done, right? Then you can actually hold feet to the fire, right? You know, and then uh, who's going to do the work, 
right? Human capital. Right, you know, as we look at uh, underserved communities and that prom committee again, or that limited prom committee, right, uh, that's where our partnerships come in as a higher education institution. We can help supplement that process that, uh, that uh, helps build that capacity. And, and then uh, we learn how to plan better, right? You know, that means that we take the time uh, and we allow the timeline for um, uh, not only relationship building, but also uh, the ability to change strategies, right? You know, many of this work is being done from a Western context for the first time. And because it's being done for the first time, we need to have the latitude to allow tribes to um, uh, take their time, right? To change horses in midstream. Right uh, to change strategies, right, and that that comes uh, through the through having a very strong evaluation process. So as we think about indigenous um, uh, uh, methodologies for evaluation, um, I was in a training where um, uh, they utilized art, you know, to create a logic model, right, you know, and so it was of course this very large tree. Right, and all the roots was all of the programmatic functions. Right, you know, so as we think about uh, uh, allowing tribes to be innovative, utilizing uh, oral tradition, utilizing art, culture, life ways uh, as a part of programmatic output, it gives us the opportunity to really explore new spaces that we don't tend to explore when we think about things from a Eurocentric perspective. Uh, so, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, some of the work that we've done in our partnership, I'm going to speed up here just a little bit. Um, uh, uh, we've conducted a land use census, um, uh, Okomi, our land, our voice survey in Blackfeet country. Um, it, was, uh, uh, it was real short, right? You know, we didn't want to make it too long because we wanted to up participation rates, you know, so it ended up being, I think, 19 pages, right? You know, after we cut it down, I think 122 questions, right? You know, we got um, almost 700 responses. You know, and so that's amazing. That's an, um, excuse me, an amazing response rate. And so, but more importantly, it allows us to begin to create that foundation for uh, the Blackfeet Nation to um, uh, create its own data, right? And we're also working on natural resource and GIS inventory. Uh, we recently received a grant at the Blackfeet Nation to, uh, um, uh, to map the entire Blackfeet Nation in orthorectified photogrammetry. <laughs> And, uh, and LIDAR mapping, you know, so as we think about, um, uh, about how we utilize that technology to um, uh, prevent drought, to do many of those things, it offers us great uh, tools in terms, of, um, in terms of the output for that technology. Uh, we just recently installed uh, core stations, and so we have to provide a guidance to the state and their surveyors when they come on the Blackfeet Nation because we can, uh, I think, uh, map down to, I, I think it's a quarter inch, right? And so uh, as we think about um, about many of those spaces that are going on. It offers another great opportunity for those partnerships. Um, where are you going? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. <laughs> So uh, when we think about intellectual and biosystem uh, property protection, I'll cover that a little bit uh, as I go into the move into the IRI, and I will speed this up a little bit because um, I know we've had a long day, a long afternoon. And so, um, but uh, at the very end of the day, as we strengthen tribal IRBs, it allows us to protect intellectual property, cultural property, all of that, and um, and uh, ensure that those protections um, are translated here at the university. When I was at the Smithsonian Institution. We pushed through a policy that required the institution to enter into licensing agreements um, uh, that recognize the intellectual property rights of tribes. We don't have the ability to say we own that dance or we own that song or we own that research, right? So as we look at um, uh, uh, potential opportunities through the Indigenous Research Initiative, we want to be very cognizant about how we utilize that to protect tribal intellectual property. Because it is low-hanging fruit, because it is new knowledge in a Western system, not in our own systems, right, it tends to get exploited. So when we think about the extractive nature of a market-based economy, it's up to us sitting in this room to ensure that we're protecting that intellectual property. So as we think about a holistic perspective, right, which is aligned with um, uh, life ways of indigenous people, uh, this is a holistic um, uh, uh, approach to food sovereignty. As we look at regaining access to cultural, uh, culture and, and traditional foods, uh, human uh, health and well-being, 
agriculture and food and land access. Uh, we want to uh, get there through um, ensuring that we're um, uh, meeting the, our strategic pillars to create sustainable economic development, to strengthen cultural knowledge, increase organizational development, invest in Bagani people, and promote health, healing, and, and nutrition. How are we going to get there uh, by the plans that we've created or the implementation of those plans? You know, through the planning process, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to increase the probability for implementation of those plans uh, through the, the methodology that we utilize to plan in the first place. Uh, we also want to use uh, research and, and new tools that are available to us, technology, right, that uh, also recognizes the policies that go along with them so that we can protect things like um, uh, the mapping of traditional foods, for example. Um, and then we want to ensure that we're thinking about how we unravel the jurisdictional complexities around trust land management so that we can make uh, native trust land uh, more productive for native people. Uh, as we think about that, uh, the, that outside circle is uh, how we uh, navigate agricultural land laws, policies, and negotiations. And I'll cover this in a minute. Um, uh, but also how we uh, um, uh, conduct indigenous research, right? And um, uh, the need for increased internal capacity, right? We can um, uh, enter into partnerships all day long, but if we don't have an adequate delivery system in place um, uh, uh, within that tribal nation, then we're going to continue to experience the gaps that we exist in our our current efforts as we develop those partnerships. And then we have to align and coordinate uh, our food production and delivery system, right? We can utilize, tri not, not utilize, we can partner with tribes to redefine the, the food delivery system, right? To create new markets locally. You know, as we went through the 70s and the 80s and we saw corporate farming really um, uh, uh, monopolize that space and take it away from the family farmer, the family producer, we can re-establish uh, that, um, that space uh, through tribes through tribal production, through the investment of those food delivery systems that, um, uh, that we can create through codification, through the legal framework, through a real foundation that allows us to not only pilot, but also uh, that allows us to experiment, right? You know, so it gives great opportunity. So as we think about, uh, as we think about that, um, we, um, uh, through the partnership, received a, uh, a grant through the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, um, uh, a million dollar grant, uh, between um, uh, Montana State University, the Native Land Project, or Native Studies, uh, the Bakani Lodge Health Institute, uh, and the Blackfeet Nation to really explore how we unravel those jurisdictional uh, complexities around trust land management, how we um, uh, look at a, a few different things that I'll cover here in a moment. But a part of that is really through that Okomi survey to begin to measure well-being to the watershed level, right? So as we think about well-being, um, we're developing indicators, right, that will help us uh, measure well-being. We know that tribal lifeways, right, the, li the, the, pro uh, the practice of who we are as Indigenous people is absolutely aligned with land use, right, uh, as we think about land use in a modern context, right? And so our tie to the land is... Um, is uh, very important as we think about uh, um, uh, health and well-being. <clears throat> As we think about uh, that FAR grant, right, you know, a part of that FAR grant was to develop process maps around uh, interior uh, um, Indian uh, land management functions, um, uh, not only for the producer or for the landowner to navigate the process, but to, to give you indication of how complicated that process is, right? You know, so as we think about uh, the inability of tribes to really be, or, or tribal folks to really be productive on their lands, we need to be thinking about solutions at the 30,000 foot level that allow us to, to create those translational models that have influence not only in Blackfeet country, not only in, uh, for tribes here in Montana, but across the country. So this um, particular project will serve as a template for how we think about uh, not only the mapping of, of process, right, but the comparative, comparative analysis that we must do from an economic standpoint that says, okay, here's what it costs to uh, navigate, say, a right away, right, um, through uh, BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, right? Um, here's the timeline that's associated with it, right? And usually that timeline is about a year and a half, two years, right? Uh, here's what it is to, to uh, navigate that 
that process through a county government, right? That's usually two weeks, right? So what are the costs that are associated with uh, navigating that process uh, of Indian trust land? And what are the additional costs that native producers and native landowners must um, uh, go through just to navigate that process? What are the additional costs like uh, environmental assessment? When we think about uh, uh, agricultural improvements across the country, only in Indian country do you have to have an environmental assessment to put in an NRCS funded uh, gravity based water system, right? So as we think about uh, placing a placing a price tag on those processes, it allows us and tribes to then have the data to go to Congress to say, uh, simplify this process, right? Here's the economic impact because we know in a market-based economy that everything is about the money, right? You know, and if you can't show the adverse impact uh, in terms of currency, right, you know, then uh, you don't go anywhere. Then you're just viewed as idealistic, right? So this uh, particular uh, project allows us the opportunity to create that foundation and not only how you uh, create those partnerships with tribes, but how we at the university or, or the uh, educational institution can really help tribes not only think through uh, the process, but also uh, create the data that allows them to make their lands more productive. And so I'm just going to do that one more time just because I really like this slide. Right, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, it also is a measurement of whether or not you're awake, I guess. As we think about land use and well-being, um, we want to uh, look at the, the uh, seven variables and the 45 indicators and think about, um, uh, about how we measure well-being, how we create a, a Blackfeet well-being index, right, that allows us to look at socioeconomic data, that allows us to layer health data, that allows us to layer uh, uh, other data sets that uh, give us a measurement of well-being, right? You know, so as we think about regaining access to medicinal plants, traditional foods, um, uh, healthier foods, their correlation to how we narrow health disparities in Indian communities. It offers great opportunity for all of us sitting in this room to take our piece of the pie and figure out how we create those partnerships with tribes. Um, we recently uh, received money to develop a regenerative grazing program that really looks at indigenous methodologies mixed with um, uh, Western methodologies. So as we think about, um, there was a gentleman, uh, a Hopi gentleman by the name of Michael Johnson that did his PhD dissertation on Hopi methodologies and conservation and land management, right? He did, then did a side-by-side -side comparison with NRCS standards. So as we look at the ability for tribes to help influence that space, right now, NRCS CS has to recognize those Hopi standards in uh, uh, the awarding of an equip contract, right? You know, the awarding of, of conservation upgrades. So as we think about um, uh, uh, this uh, particular space in Blackfeet country and in tribes here in Montana, we can look at indigenous methodologies for conservation and utilize that to help gain access for tribal producers to um, uh, needed federal resources, right? As you look at the distribution of federal resources through NRCS, there's a huge disparity right because the eligibility requirements for USDA participation are often misaligned with trust land management so all of these um, uh, uh, um, solutions right you know um, are opportunities for all of you to think about as you uh, take the space that you serve in here at the university and create those um, equi equitable those equitable those equitable partnerships with tribes, right? So, so when we think about equitable, that means that if we're getting a million dollars from NIH, we're utilizing native um, research assistance, right? We're utilizing native co-PIs, right? We're spending that, uh, uh, that money in Indian country as well, right? We're not gonna sit under our higher education umbrella, never leave it, right, and, uh, and build capacity here at the institution. We're going to help tribes build that capacity through that partnership building. Right, you know, so getting back to the regenerative grazing practice, it allows us to look at Western methodologies, indigenous methodologies, create a mixed methodology that allows us to get the greatest impact for soil health, right, for water health, for regeneration, for all of that. So as we think about product, uh, production agriculture, it gives us the opportunity to really um, uh, kick that door in, right? You know, I'm not going to cover too much of this. Um, uh, we also partnered um, uh, to um, uh, conduct a feasibility study for a Blackfeet conservation area. Okay, I am going to get into it. <laughs> 
Um, you know, the mission is to develop a formal conservation area controlled, owned, and managed by the Blackfeet people, which in turn spurs economic development opportunities. Right? And so as we think about a Blackfeet conservation area, we partnered also with the University of Montana School of Law to do a legal review on the applicability of collecting fees on state highways. So if we want to create a Blackfeet conservation area um, or a Blackfeet park, right, you know, we can uh, uh, transverse the four entrances into Glacier, and then you have to pay to get uh, uh, through Blackfeet right, into Glacier. Right, as we look at the uh, limitations that the U.S. Supreme Court has placed on tribes and their inability to tax uh, non-members and non-natives, uh, tribal governments lack the income streams that other governments and municipalities have uh, through taxation. So we need to be very innovative in how we think about the fee structure and utilize that fee structure to underwrite uh, natural resource management functions, agricultural resource management functions under the tribal government umbrella. Uh, it also allows us to preserve space, right? As we think about the preservation of that biodiversity, that biohabitat, all of that, uh, um, uh, tribal set asides for gathering of medicinal plants, traditional foods. Uh, it, it allows us to put tribes um, in, in a really good space to lead uh, innovative methodologies for conservation. Um, we also of course, support conservation. As we look at the results of that Okomi survey, 77% uh, support a tribal conservation area. 20% don't know, right? That's a, a great opportunity, right? To raise that to, I guess it'd be 96.2%, right? 81% gra support grassland protection. 89% believe conservation creates jobs, right? You know, so as we think about uh, conservation at the ballot box, we know that indigenous people at about a 90% clip at the ballot box, support conservation, right? African Americans, about 80%, Hispanics and, um, and Asians, about 65%, dominant culture, 41%, right? So opportunity, right, opportunity. It also allows us to catalyze connectivity, right? As we think about um, uh, uh, wildlife corridors, uh, wildlife migration, uh, it allows us to link ecosystems. It allows us to rewild the landscape uh, for those areas that we need to reintroduce. Uh, those are usually non-native spaces. Um, uh, it allows us to protect regional plant biodiversity. As we think about protections in animals versus plants, there's a huge gap. You know, so as we think about uh, medicinal plants in Blackfeet country and how we protect their habitat. It offers uh, translational models that can be easily duplicated in other spaces. Uh, it allows us to conserve entire watersheds. And as we think about indigenous methodologies for water resource management, we can look at wetlands creation, right? Natural water storage opportunities, floodplain restoration that allows us to bank uh, that spring runoff, right? And get late season flow so you can irrigate into first frost, right? It allows us to uh, think about drought mitigation through wetlands creation, biohabitat creation, all of that. Uh, it allows us to increase Blackfeet Nation climate resiliency as we think about the impact that uh, climate change has had on, not only on Glacier National Park, but the Blackfeet Nation right east, to Glacier, uh, right east of Nation, uh, Glacier National Park. Right? Um, when we think about indigenous-led conservation, I'd mentioned this statistic earlier. Um, uh, we have um, uh, uh, 80, 25% uh, of the land mass, 80% of the biodiversity. Species decline in, is substantially slower on lands of indigenous people, right? So it uh, offers us the opportunity to truly be proactive. Right, you know, as we think about implementation of plans, we have 21 plans in synergy at the Blackfeet Nation, right? The opportunity and implementation of those plans offers great opportunity in research here at the institution. So uh, as we think about um, uh, making research that's been done here at the institution available to tribes, so heaven, for, uh, heaven forbid they use it, right? You know, we also can think about making those plans that tribes have developed uh, available to the university so that we can uh, create some uh, great partnerships and research projects, right? Um, uh, as we think about conservation, we've been um, able to um, uh, identify eight priority areas, land, water, agriculture, rangeland, wildlife, forest, wilderness, and a nature-based economy. So as we think about uh, the contributions to um, uh, uh, from tribes, right, in the spaces of ecotourism, agritourism, cultural tourism, uh, uh, commercial food production, all of that, uh, it gives us all great opportunity. I'm going to move through this. Uh, I, I know that it's getting a little bit long, and you all have had 
quite a bit to eat, and so I see a few eyes closing, and I sure hate to point them out. <laughs> so uh, as we think about uh, expected benefits, right, you know, um, I think it's kind of self-explanatory. I'm not going to go through those uh, since I do see uh, quite a few folks that are starting to doze. <laughs> uh, when we think about our metrics, I think that I mentioned this earlier, um, uh, we are looking at conservation and well-being, a holistic and systems approach. We do have seven uh, indicator areas with 45 variables. We're in the middle of creating uh, Bagani Well-Being Index that uh, takes into consideration all of those things, right, you know, and their uh, contribution to uh, health and to well-being. Right, as we think about indigenous partnerships and, uh, and uh, re applied research, right, you know, moving knowledge to action, action back to knowledge, uh, creating new knowledge. It offers us great opportunities here at the, excuse me, the institution to move into that space. Right, um, all of those maroon areas that you see are tribal, uh, are tribal lands. Um, I think that we heard this afternoon, uh, thanks to Herrera versus Wyoming, Right, and the, uh, and the Supreme Court upholding um, uh, 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 tribal, tribal, uh, tribal treaty rights around hunting, fishing, and gathering, it offers us the opportunity to influence about 10 times those maroon spaces as we think about tribes' reserved rights in their treaty territory. So we can be entering as a tribe into MOUs with public land managers, influencing the management in those spaces um, uh, for uh, biodiversity protection, uh, for um, access to medicinal plants, traditional foods, um, all of that. So as we think about the opportunities that exist and how we utilize our work with tribes to have greater influence in those public spaces, those partnerships are just waiting to happen. Right, collaborating with indigenous governments, communities, and organizations conserves biodiversity while supporting indigenous rights to land, sustainable resource use, and well-being. So I think I'm just going to beat a good horse to death on that one, <laughs> right? You know, as we think about uh, Home for Indigenous-led research here at Montana State University, it offers us great opportunity to not only strengthen those tribal IR IRBs, uh, create those strong partnerships with tribes, but more importantly, um, uh, create a new space for tribal and uh, non-native scholars to really uh, move into spaces that haven't um, uh, necessarily been touched yet, right? So as we think about Indigenous research, it gives great opportunity here at Montana State as well. Uh, as we think about the opportunity and we think about objectives um, uh, uh, through Montana State University, we have the native provision um, in the strategic plan that, um, uh, that calls for uh, those partnerships, right? It allows us to fulfill Morrill Land Grant School, uh, the Morrill Land Grant School mission, embolden nat native student enrollment, uh, become a leader in indigenous research and scholarship, uh, not just for the region, but for the country. It al also allows us to expand research funding. You know, I think I mentioned expanding that from 25 million to maybe 50 million, 75 million, 100 million, right? You know, but we have to also invest in uh, the tribal IRB process. It'll create greater efficiency. So as you look at the backlog uh, that is placed on those um, volunteer boards, institutional review boards in tribal nations, uh, we need to be investing in those uh, institutional review boards, underwriting those institutional review boards so that uh, we create, uh, uh, so that we um, improve the efficiency of those IRBs and not only helping um, uh, native students, but non-native students as well, research uh, pertinent topics. <clears throat> I think my hand is tired from this clicker. <laughs> Does someone want to come up and click? <laughs> So um, uh, when we think about uh, meeting pre uh, pressing indigenous research agendas and we think about uh, spaces that we can help tribes, we want to be thinking about how we improve local economic development, right? That's a misnomer. You know, um, uh, as we look at, you know, trying to flip tribal economies from a public sector-based economy to a private sector-based economy to move them away from the, the um, I won't ask you where you're going, <laughs> to move them away from uh, uh, their dependence on cyclical funding, Right, you know, it's very important that we begin to think about how we improve um, uh, sustainable economics in Indian country, how we address the housing crisis and narrow health disparities, how we think about research around meth and the opiate epidemic um, uh, is conducted so that we can help tribes think through how to deal with these epidemics, right? You know, uh, tribal governments are at odds right now when you think about the meth epidemic and its impact not only on human health, on performance, on the achievement 
achievement gap on all of these areas. We need to be thinking as an educational institution how we um, uh, 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 provide the resources, right, through research, through those partnerships to help tribes begin to think uh, how we deal with this cri or these crises, right? Uh, systems thinking and analysis, holistic and culturally relevant approaches to all systems, right? Reclaiming management and organizational science, uh, and, uh, innovate in urban and regional planning science, restore regenerative agriculture practice and ecological stewardship, innovate in protective area management, land resource and range management, and then finally restore food sovereignty, right? And that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg as we think about the opportunities um, uh, in uh, not only those um, equitable partnerships, but the opportunities in research and how we influence or partner uh, to, to provide resources for tribes and, and uh, help them deal with the challenges that exist today. Right, you know, the relevant MSU departments, I'm not gonna go over all these, I know that you all are getting a little tired, you know, and so, uh, but as we think about some of those departments and we think about some of those fields, right, you know, this gives you a good example of, of those spaces, right, that we could be uh, utilizing here at the university to help build those partnerships. You know, as we think about um, uh, the strategic uh, goal uh, within the strategic plan that really calls for uh, mutually beneficial partnerships with tribes, it allows us to move into that space and be the first in the nation to really uh, reclaim that space, right? As we think about uh, how we utilize WinHEC, right, and, and the WinHEC accreditation process to create a, a livable environment for our native students here at the university, it becomes very important, right? You know, as you think about the crossroads of uh, implementing the, the MSU native prov prov uh, provision in the strategic plan, about the WinHEC accredi accreditation uh, process, and about the Indigenous Research Initiative, it allows us to move squarely in the space uh, of um, uh, creating excuse me, uh, creating um, uh, an advisory board that's led by tribal people to help us think through uh, the implementation of many of these initiatives. So as you think about um, uh, tribal IRB board members, as you think about tribal college board members and tribal leaders, we want to take a cross section of those three institutions uh, to create a, an advisory board here at MSU that, uh, over, uh, that provides oversight for the Indigenous Research Initiative, the WinHEC accreditation process, and the implementation of the native provision of the Montana State University strategic plan. So it, uh, it offers great opportunity across the board. So, um, oops, so with that, um, uh, I just leave you with this, you know, as we think about holism and we think about indigenous approaches um, and how we um, uh, help partner uh, in those spaces. Uh, what is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in the win winter time. It is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. As long as the sun shines and the waters flow, this land will be here to give life to men and animals. And that was Crowfoot, uh, uh, a Blackfoot orator. So as we think about, um, uh, about that space, uh, and we think about, um, uh, uh, about those uh, meaningful partnerships with tribes, um, I encourage you to all uh, leave tonight and, and, and uh, as you lie, uh, lie awake at night and wonder, um, think about uh, uh, within your umbrella where we can be creating uh, uh, stronger, equitable partnerships with tribal nations. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I know that um, many people have questions, so uh, I'm going to administratively decide not to have questions and answers. Uh, we're very fortunate that, uh, come back here, <laughs> that uh, uh, Lauren is going to be with us um, uh, as our CATS chair, and so if you are on campus, he's very uh, um, uh, willing to, to visit with you, and um, there's still some dessert outside. But I do want to leave him with a token of our gratitude as we uh, traditionally do. Uh, Native American Studies presents our, our, um, our uh, speakers with, with a, a blanket, and so I'd like to present that to you. Locally sourced, no. <laughs> and of course, I can't open it. So let's come over here. And we hope that he remembers fondly uh, his experience tonight. And uh, so I'd like to present this to you. I don't know how you want to. Just come up here. 
Yes, and, and uh, thank the folks. Uh, thank you to the folks that joined uh, on the live feed from PBS. Um, uh, we certainly appreciate your attention as well. Thank you all so much.